The establishment. The Democratic Party corporate establishment. The establishment. The establishment. We've heard that term thrown around a lot these days. If you listen to well-paid TV anchors, the very notion of an establishment is a wild conspiracy theory. They see any criticism of the same small group of people holding onto the reins of power as illegitimate. To understand what the establishment means in American politics, we're going to need to take a broad view and get some perspective. We're going to need to step... Well, hello there. Welcome to Step Back. Now, the idea of a party establishment isn't new. The internal structure of American political parties up until relatively recently was decided in smoke-filled rooms by party insiders. Even the idea of needing to earn votes rather than simply making promises to certain constituencies is relatively new. When we talk about the establishment today, we are usually referring to the American Democratic Party, so we're just gonna zoom right in on them. Let's start by looking at the biggest insider-outsider clash that set the trajectory for where we are today, the 1968 Democratic primaries. 1968 was a year of chaos. Martin Luther King was assassinated, sparking riots across the country. The anti-war movement was at a boiling point, and the Democratic Party, led by President Lyndon B. Johnson, was going through the primary process. The party was torn over the issue of the Vietnam War. Now, it's uncommon to challenge a sitting president in their own party's primary. Still, anti-war activists tried to find a way to dump Johnson, and they managed to get Minnesota Senator Eugene McCarthy to challenge him. The idea was to pressure President Johnson to make him end the war. McCarthy gained the support of a massive swell of young people. In an unprecedented shock, McCarthy came within 10% in the New Hampshire primary against a sitting president, a blow to the party bosses by charged activist youth. Soon after, Senator Robert F. Kennedy, JFK's brother, put his hat in the ring. President Johnson, seeing bad numbers in upcoming primaries, along with declining health, declared that he would not seek re-election. There was another reason he left the race, though. The party wanted to run a candidate from the Democratic establishment. They felt that they could challenge these youth-driven insurgent campaigns by using Johnson's vice president, Hubert Humphrey. Humphrey had the support of traditional Democratic Party power brokers, party bosses and labor unions, but McCarthy ran with a groundswell of students and activists. At the same time, Kennedy built a coalition of poor people, Catholics, and various ethnic and racial minorities, especially black people. Right-wing Democrats in the South were upset by Johnson's passing of the Civil Rights Act and his stances against segregation. So they moved over to a third party run by segregationist George Wallace. The primaries were mostly a contest between McCarthy and Kennedy. Humphrey, who didn't have much popular support, didn't even run in the primaries, instead opting to only compete in caucus states, which back then were decided by party insiders. Things were beginning to heat up. At this point, the race took a sharp, tragic turn. Fighting back and forth over primary states, Kennedy narrowly defeated McCarthy in California. After making his victory speech, a man named Sirhan Sirhan shot and killed Kennedy, the second assassination of a U.S. senator in history. Like, holy sh**, you think the Democratic primaries we're going through are full of drama? Imagine if somebody had straight up murdered Bernie Sanders. Imagine what mental gymnastics Neera Tandon would have to go through. The race was then down to McCarthy against Humphrey. One had the people, the other had the party. By the end, McCarthy walked into the Democratic convention with the popular vote, but didn't have Kennedy's charisma and base. At the convention, Humphrey was coronated as the nominee and Americans watched as the Chicago police brutalized the anti-war protesters at the event. After the assassination of Robert Kennedy, now the party was literally using the police to beat protesters. It just gives you a tiny glimpse of what a mess the Democratic Party was in. This is just one of many events in a brutal year, 
where some feared 1968 would actually spell the collapse of the United States. But that's a different video. The activist youth saw Humphrey for what he was, a product of party machinery placed in the race to oppose the candidates of the young activists who wanted big changes. Humphrey had no grassroots support. Many felt robbed in favor of a pro-war establishment candidate. And the result was one of the biggest sweeps for the Republicans in American history. Richard Nixon became president, and because of the Wallace campaign, the Democrats lost their base of white racists in the South. In response, the party attempted to open the caucuses and primaries to let more people vote on the candidate they wanted for the presidency. They actually did open up the primary process for outsiders, but after lost elections in 1972 and 1980, the Democratic Party decided the primary process just had way too much democracy. So, instead of appealing to independence or further opening the process so more of those undecided voters could get involved, they implemented a system of unpledged superdelegates to give the party establishment power to put their thumb on the scales and prevent outsiders from running away with the nomination. Or at least make it harder. Since primaries happen in a particular order, people tend to consolidate around a perceived winner, which allows the party to use just a bit of pressure to get only the candidates they want. Unpledged delegates exist really to make sure that party leaders and elected officials don't have to be in a position where they are running against grassroots activists. And so we separate out those unpledged delegates to make sure there isn't competition between them. When less democracy didn't lead to electoral victories, weird that, they tried a different tactic, abandoning traditional Democratic allies in favor of trying to siphon off some Republican ones. They believed the Democrats needed to double down on market-driven solutions and neoliberalism. They called this move to the right the third way. The leaders in this race to the right were people like Al Gore and Joe 30330. I mean, Joe Biden, and called themselves the New Democrats. This is the socially liberal, fiscally conservative crowd. The first candidate the New Democrats backed was Bill Clinton. The party decided that relying on labor was a losing bet when it came under attack by Republican governments. Instead of standing up for workers' values, they reached out to the finance sector. This mix of moderate social progressiveness and far-right economics has dominated the Democratic Party since. It was the ideology of both Clinton and Obama, the two presidents they've had since the 1980s. The ideas these new Democrats pushed are so dominant that even moderate Democratic ideas from before the 90s are considered pie-in-the-sky ideas. However, recent events have shown that capitalism tends to be unstable even at the best of times. A tiny shock to the system causes it to implode. The 2008 financial crash and the massive bailout of the banks which caused that crash, rather than the people who lost their life savings and their homes, but you know, whatever, challenged the new Democrat orthodoxy. A groundswell of support for progressive policies, starting with the Occupy Wall Street movement, has swept into politics, challenging the party establishment itself. The progressive tide, to labor a metaphor, paved the way for the insurgent primary campaigns of Bernie Sanders in 2016 and in 2020, a man not often invited to the Democratic brunch. Unfortunately, Bernie was defeated in 2016, and it's not looking promising this year either. Now, it would be easy to blame Bernie's losses on institutional resistance and an ideologically stubborn Democratic leadership. So easy. So easy that it is exactly what I'm going to do. Actually, no, I can't do that because there are more things that are also true. Sadly, these are systemic problems, deeply embedded in not only the Democratic Party, but the country's politics and history as a whole. Yes, I know, I still am a history YouTuber, you know, now and then. So what keeps the establishment going? Lots of things, actually. The first is money. Turns out the financial sector has a lot more money than unions do, and elections cost money. Conventional wisdom was, until recently anyway, that the best financed candidate 
would win. Your average American congressperson, for example, spends hours nearly every day not visiting constituents, not in committees, not writing or editing bills, but on the phone with big donors asking for cash. The removal of campaign spending limits in the 2010 Supreme Court case Citizens United has ratcheted up the pressure even more. A new member of Congress can be expected to raise something like $18,000 a day, and very often those big ticket donors expect something in return. It can be a very lucrative investment to buy a politician to lower regulations and taxes. When the lifeblood of a party is based on donations from large corporations like banks and tech companies, you can then imagine that challenging them could be very unpopular in the party. And if you do mount a challenge, you're not super likely to win elections. But this might be increasingly less true. The most well-funded primary challengers in recent years, like Jeb Bush Please clap. or Michael Bloomberg, didn't actually see their money translate into votes in the age of social media and a press hungry for drama and big media moments. But we'll get to them later. Even so, the addiction to rich people's money is still a robust institutional culture which perpetuates itself. In addition to fundraising culture, the establishment is also reinforced by people looking to keep themselves in a job. American political parties are large organizations with tons of money flowing through them. And with that is a prime opportunity for lots of people, often veterans of the parties, to make tons of money themselves. One such industry is lobbying. Lobbyists work on behalf of interest groups and industries to influence politicians to sway legislation in their favor. Surprise, such a job is perfect for those former party insiders who still have the connections to do said influencing. So many former politicians and party officials go into lobbying. They call it the revolving door. Lobbyists are paid very well for this work, so keeping their friends in power benefits their job prospects. I should also add that politicians themselves know that this is a possible very lucrative career after their jobs are over, so being friendly to lobbyists is part of the status quo. Another way to keep former party insiders gainfully employed is through consulting. Campaigns hire armies of consultants. There's an entire industry of consultants hired to crunch data, make recommendations, and win elections, all the while making the big bucks. So again, these folks benefit from keeping their friends in power. Similarly, wealthy venture capitalists can make fat stacks designing things like, I don't know, just off the top of my head, malfunctioning caucus reporting apps. They don't really need to work, but are owned by someone who is a friend of a friend of, let's say, the chair of the Iowa Democratic Party. So. They got the contract anyway. And last on our list of lampreys feeding off the blood of the party are think tanks, research organizations which develop policy and get a lot of money in donations themselves. Some advocates for ideas and policies that people with lots of money tend to donate to. They know that if the ruling ideology of their party changes, they might find themselves without influence and thus made irrelevant. So as you can see, many people's fortunes and entire careers rely on certain people maintaining power. This tangled web is concentrated in Washington, D.C., but they exist in every state. Many of these people, as you can imagine, are incredibly wealthy, and the success of far-right Democrats and Republicans is good for maintaining that wealth. When you get to the top, the world is a lot smaller than you think. So they talk and they share material interests. They go to the same parties. They even marry each other. That means the same policies benefit them, pushing them in similar directions, even if not coordinating their efforts. Even media organizations and their high profile journalists are part of this web. And this leads to the cultivation of a very friendly press. The mainstream press in America, especially the major cable news networks, are highly influential, especially with older folks. It's also big business. Many writers and anchors on cable news are paid very well. So 
their own desire to keep their personal wealth safe influences the lenses they use to perceive the world and changes their coverage. So much so that us jaded millennials and Zoomers from outside see it as absolutely ridiculous sometimes. High-powered journalists also thrive on access. If you are too negative to a campaign for president and they win, you might find yourself locked out of big interviews or tips or White House press room access, all of which are significant drivers of ratings. And so they have no incentive to go too hard on the powerful who control their profits and could ensure ratings gold for the future. Meanwhile, outsiders who don't go to the fancy wine cave parties, who aren't as likely to win, and who push policies that threaten to slow how fast you accumulate wealth are either ignored or attacked. This point of view, shaped by wealthy news personalities, is broadcast over and over again, constantly reinforced, and ultimately shapes the perspective of those who watch it. This process is called manufacturing consent, and the book by the same name is a fantastic and critical read to understand media. Psychologists have found that the mere exposure to something, be that ideas, names, or slogans, repeatedly generates familiarity, which leads to positive attitudes towards said thing. That's one of the many reasons the 4chan teens turn from edgy trolls to neo-Nazis. So we know now who stands to benefit from the establishment, but why do they win primaries? There are many ways to influence who comes up in the party through the primary processes. Politicians with similar ideologies rise to the top and push back on those who challenge it. They push back by creating powerful local machines which influence elections. Or just for the hell of it, they might force everyone on the right wing of a presidential primary to all simultaneously drop out of competing races to all endorse one guy all at once. Not better. The establishment has also won the loyalty of some, fighting through political fights in communities long brutalized by complicated histories of oppression and violence. To some of these communities, especially older black communities in the South, the Democratic Party was one of the few powerful institutions who had their back leading to decades of strong loyalty. I wouldn't call these people part of the establishment, just a reliable source of support. There is a problem though. While this works to win primaries, at least most of the time, it doesn't win elections. All the interests I've mentioned that keep the people who are in charge in charge don't necessarily align with the desires of the electorate. And these people clinging to power in their parties often result in candidates who might be just a bit out of touch with the voters they need. Pokemon go to the polls. Oh, and of course, to win an election, you need lots of enthusiastic supporters and someone handpicked by the party might not get that turnout, just like Hubert Humphrey. Hey everyone, I am a full-time YouTuber, which means that to pay rent and keep my cats fed, I would like to take a moment to talk about this video sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community for creatives where millions come together to take the next step in their creative journeys. Skillshare offers thousands of inspiring classes for creative and curious people on topics including illustration, design, photography, video, freelancing, and more. For some reason, you might find yourself with a lot of time on your hands right now, and Skillshare is a place where you can pick up new skills and develop yourself while stuck indoors. One course I've been enjoying myself is uh, just a little Journalism 101 by Donna DeRosa, where I am learning how journalists do their craft to, you know, improve mine a little bit. If you want to pick up some valuable skills for the dystopian gig economy, the link in the description will give you two free months of the premium service. A little dosh in your pocket for putting some in mine. Thank you Skillshare for sponsoring this video. As I wrote this video, we were hit by a worldwide catastrophic pandemic, and we watched the establishment fail to do even the most basic things to respond to it. For example, the Democrats pushed a bill in the House which would guarantee sick leave, but they decided to compromise down so that 
80% of people would actually not be affected by this bill. And very recently, a story came out that showed that plenty of politicians were told, informed, about the potential deep impacts of the pandemic, and instead of trying to get ahead of this, instead of trying to mitigate the impact or warn the American people, they instead decided to sell their stocks as kind of a form of subtle insider trading, including Democratic Senator Dianne Feinstein. And yet still, people risk their lives to go out and vote for more of the same. Rest assured, when the new Hubert Humphrey goes out, those wanting change will be morally blackmailed again and again to line up behind their empty suit. And whether we help or not, that same media machine will make it our fault. It all feels actually uh, kind of hopeless, doesn't it? I talk about this stuff a lot in my streams. I often wake up thinking about how we can possibly turn the latest catastrophe into some sort of hopeful message. This cycle of being denied a voice and harassed into choosing the lesser of two evils needs to break. But how do we do it? Is there another way? Well, I'm actually going to think of proposals. I have three. My first is actually already in progress, but I think it needs to happen more. For America, and honestly, many Western countries can make any progress on the myriad issues that we face. We need to fix the media ecosystem. With the consent manufacturers, manufacturing consent will always have to fight the backlash of everyday people told to vote against their own class interests and want us to as well. Media organizations need to be pressured. Like when podcaster Benjamin Dixon pushed research on Michael Bloomberg into the mainstream to expose the skeletons in his closet to the whole world before he could straight up buy the White House. We also need to grow new media sources, which go around the gatekeepers. Alternative media, like myself actually, hi everybody, uh, needs to grow in prominence and scope. By the way, like, share, and subscribe. Not sure how, but we need to change the tide of thought. We need to get the work that's going on in online spaces to the kind of people who watch cable news to inform their political opinions. Also, we need to post. Twitter might not be real life, but some journalists seem to think it is. If something's being ignored, push them not to ignore it. Maybe just a few of those reporters will actually pick it up. Long shot, but... It's worth a try. The second proposal is that the United States needs power structures outside of the party to get outsiders in. This may mean activist organizations to find progressive candidates like Our Revolution or Justice Democrats, but we also need to, in the wake of the 2020 primaries, at least consider a new political party, which actually advocates for non-corporate ideals. Maybe not at the presidential level, as the Electoral College makes that a mess, but there are many non-competitive or straight up uncontested races that such a group could move into. With luck, a progressive kingmaker in US Congress could drive some key legislation. The third proposal, almost the opposite goal of that, is we need to redouble efforts on organizing outside of electoral politics. As an anarchist, you know, flag, uh, who frequently gets lost in electoralism, I need to focus on understanding that to some extent. The state's never really going to be our ally. It might just be next to impossible to get good candidates into power through acceptable means. A way forward may be advocating ideas through community-focused projects. If the state won't do something, we should organize, make a way to do it ourselves. We're in a pandemic and the number of mutual support networks popping up is inspiring, especially as the state practically ignores anybody with less than a seven digit bank account. Realizing we don't really have an ally in the organizations which dominate us and making our own support is vital. For positive change, agitation and protest might be our only ways to budge the needle, even a little bit. Maybe running for elections and getting the right people in is in and of itself a fruitless endeavor. The establishment does not need to be a conspiracy theory. It's influential people in the upper economic classes who have similar interests and want to maintain their power and privilege. That's it. That's the tweet. People in the same classes benefit from the same state of affairs. It's just about time 
we who are not wealthy consider what our interests are and push for that together too. Be sure to share this video and thank you to my patrons for making this video possible. If you want to help me make ends meet for as little as a dollar a month, go to patreon.com slash stepbackhistory. See you all next time.